Welcome back everyone to the Textiles and Manuscripts Workshop, Cross-Cultural Trade, Craft Production and Influence in the Art of the Pre-Modern Book. We've had an amazing two days of interdisciplinary discussion and I wanna start this final um, two sessions by introducing our speakers. And, um, and then we're going to wrap it up with a, um, an all panelist discussion. So everyone that's been around for the two days, that's a panelist, please do join back in and show your video um, after the four, first 40 minutes of this section of the session. So um, uh, I'm gonna start by introducing Rosemary Krill and then I'll introduce Suzanne Akbari and then um, there won't be an interruption uh, as, as we move into the, uh, the sessions. Rosemary Krill is a specialist in South Asian textiles and was for 38 years a curator in the Indian, later Asian department of the Victorian Albert Museum in London, focusing on the textiles of India and surrounding countries, the historical international trade in Indian cotton textiles to Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia and Tibet, local imitations of Indian textiles in Iran, the Middle East and Europe, and specific techniques in South Asian textiles. She's published and lectured widely. Too many, too many things to point out here, but among her numerous publications is Chintz, Indian Textiles for the West, Textiles from India, The Global Trade, and The Fabric of India, which she was editor and primary author for in 2015 and accompanied a major exhibition at the V&A of which she was co-curator. Krill and her textile scholars, uh, colleagues have been instrumental in the research completed for this Textiles and Manuscripts Workshop, consulting with scholars across sessions. I don't think there's anything that has not been touched <laughs> by, by the team. And we're so pleased that she's joined us for this interdisciplinary endeavor. I think everyone is on, on all sides, all areas is learning a lot. Suzanne, Con Su Suzanne Conklin Akbari is a professor of medieval studies at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey. She was for many years a faculty member at the University of Toronto and served for seven years as the director for the Center for Medieval Studies there until her move to the IAS. She's still affiliated as an associate member of the graduate faculty at Toronto. She has now though returned to the Northeastern United States where she lived as a child. This return has been fruitful in fostering her interest in indigenous writers and connecting with native communities in the land she lives on learning the indigenous Lenape language and fostering dialogue about how living and working on Lenape Hoking inf inflects our academic research and communities we form. Among her numerous books and publications on pedagogy, writing, medieval science and literature, she's also involved in two global medieval studies projects, the practices of commentary and the project we're gathered for today, a book in the Silk Roads, which she's co-principal investigator. Among her many other pursuits, she's also co-editor of the, the Norton Anthology of World Literature and co-hosts an amazing, I highly recommend it, podcast called The Spouter Inn. I feel like it's a graduate uh, seminar all on its own, if anyone can catch it. Akbari is a co-curator for the upcoming exhibit at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto entitled The Book on the Silk Roads, which is scheduled to open in October of this year. And I hope everyone can visit it virtually or otherwise before it closes next February. Please join me in welcoming Rosemary Krill and Suzanne Akbari. Thank you, Melissa. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 And thank you for inviting me onto this great project. Over the past months, my textile colleagues and I have seen images of several hundred textiles from the different sections of this project. This remarkable material has given us all a lot to think about in terms of historic textile trade and production, as well as the dating of textiles. I should emphasize that our findings have been made mostly on the basis of the objects shown to us by the various teams. As we've been hearing, there are plenty of other collections out there that may use completely different textiles in quite different ways. And I hope this workshop might bring these to light. I'm immensely grateful to everyone who's shared images with us, and I'd especially like to thank Hawk Kacherian for his amazing Armenian resource. I should also mention that for various and obvious reasons, we've only been able to study photographs of these textiles, not the real objects. 
This is never an ideal basis from which to discuss textiles, as understanding their materials and techniques is so crucial to their identification, as we just saw when we were discussing the Pullman manuscripts in the, in the last uh, session, trying to work out whether it was wool or not in the chat. One of the most obvious things to have come out of this workshop is that textiles are uniquely adaptable to a huge variety of uses, being physically thin and flexible and divisible into convenient sizes. As we've also seen, they're eminently transportable. We've seen Turkish, Persian, Italian, and Chinese silks used in Ethiopia, like the ones on the top row here, and below, European roller prints in Yemen, Chinese silks in Mongolia, and Indian textiles in Turkey, Burma, and all points in between. The versatility of textiles increases even further when they're recycled from earlier usages, as were so many of the pieces seen in the different areas of this project. In most cases, we can only speculate on what the original pieces were used for, and this of course would vary from region to region. But we know, for example, that patterned curtains and ritual garments were certainly used in Ethiopia, like these modern examples. And these could have been recycled in book bindings when worn out or damaged. Some of the pieces in the bindings still have seams indicating reuse, possibly from garments. Other more utilitarian textiles may well have been bought by monasteries or libraries specifically for the purpose of using them in bindings. But if this was the case, it's perhaps surprising that groups of bindings using the same textile haven't so far come to light. The lavish Chinese silk brocade book covers that Martin showed and the embroidered bag holding the Armenian gospels that Sylvie discussed are perhaps the only examples we've seen so far of objects being intended from the outset for these purposes. And at the end of this talk, I'll also touch on some other custom made covers for manuscripts. Of the different areas of investigation, the textiles used in the Ethiopian bindings show the widest range in terms of places of origin, pattern and technique as you can see just from this group on the screen. As Michael Gerber's noted, all of the textiles used in the Ethiopian bindings are imported, in spite of the fact that Ethiopia has its own long established history of weaving. Clearly the plain white cotton cloth traditionally woven in Ethiopia was considered unsuitable for use in book bindings. Imported cloth, even when of quite ordinary quality, was not only more decorative, but was also seen as more prestigious than local wares and thus more appropriate to the decoration of a revered text. Even simple monochrome dyed cotton was used in preference to the local white shama cloth. We saw the same preference for imported cloth in the Ottoman manuscript with an Indian shawl fabric that we were just talking about and in the Kashmiri manuscript discussed by Jasteep, which was covered with a Gujarati textile. Both Ottoman Turkey and Kashmir had rich textile traditions of their own and yet preferred to use cloth brought from outside the region for these books. A number of the textiles used in the Ethiopian bindings come from Europe, like these 17th century Italian silks. The range of textiles found in the Ethiopian bindings overlaps in some cases with those used in the Armenian examples. Here there's an obvious parallel between the Italian silks used in greater quantities in Ethiopia and their so far rarer occurrence in Armenian bindings like the one at the bottom right. As with all the imported textiles, the trade routes by which they reach their final homes are a rich field of study. In the case of the Italian silks, these are likely to have been traded to both Ethiopia and Armenia by already long established networks of Florentine and Venetian traders, whose silks had even been on sale in Calicut in southern India when Vasco da Gama arrived there in 1498. Iranian woven silks are also found in both Ethiopian and Armenian bindings, as we see here. While there's clearly a preference for rather lavish striped silks with floral motifs, the silk ikat fabric at the top right is of a less expensive type, usually used for bath wrappers and other domestic functions. The printed cotton striped fabric at the bottom right is also a far cheaper way of using the favorite floral stripe design than a woven silk. This mix of expensive and cheaper textiles is seen throughout the bindings in both Ethiopia and Armenia and raises questions about the selection process by which textiles were chosen for manuscripts. Was the binder consciously using more expensive and precious, prestigious textiles for the most precious manuscripts or was it purely subjective and dependent on what was to hand at the time? The relationship between the textile and the date of the manuscript and its binding should also be explored with caution 
bearing in mind that a textile far older than the manuscript itself could be chosen to decorate its binding, or indeed a newer textile would probably be used if the binding was replaced. <clears throat> so Ottoman Turkish silks in the bindings are rare, but some are of very high quality, like these three examples from Ethiopian, Armenian, and Greek bindings. And you'll recognize the Greek one from Aaron's talk, which I just pinched it from. While the Armenian and Greek centers would have been within an easy trading area for Ottoman textiles, the presence of two pieces of a court quality Turkish textile in Ethiopia, the ones at the top left, is less easy to explain and would likely have been part of a diplomatic gift rather than a traded textile. In view of the wide global spread of Chinese textiles over the centuries, it's slightly surprising to find only very few used outside their country of origin. And apart from the single color patterned Ming silks we saw in the Mongolian and Burmese book covers shown in Martin's video, they so far have only appeared in these two Ethiopian bindings, identifi identifiable as probably Chinese by the distinctive use of flat gilded paper strip instead of wrapped silk thread. Again, these would need to be examined in person to confirm that these materials are actually used. As Michael noted earlier, about half of all the textiles in the Ethiopian bindings studied so far are Indian. Many of these are plain cotton dyed in single colors or simple striped mushroom fabrics like the one at the bottom right and some with ikat patterns like the one at the bottom left. But others show a remarkable range of materials, patterns and techniques including one of the very few embroidered pieces in the top center and many are of rather high quality. The lavish silk and metal wrapped thread piece at the top right here is especially intriguing and I'll return to it shortly. A large group of cheaper block printed cottons is also present in the Ethiopian set, which also shows a certain amount of crossover with those used in the Armenian bindings. But looking at the Indian printed cottons used in the Ethiopian bindings on the top row, and those used in the Armenian ones on the bottom row, the Ethiopian examples seem to be mostly of a later, probably 19th century type, of the kind used domestically in India itself, as well as traded abroad. An exception is the piece at the top right that appears from the image to be an early, probably 15th to 16th century trade textile. The Indian prints used in the Armenian bindings on the bottom row are clearly of a different type and date and show far more similarity with the early Gujarati printed cotton fragments found in Egypt, a relationship that Thelma Thomas also discussed in the Syriac context. This pairing is a case in point with a clear parallel between the textile used in an Armenian binding on the left and just one of many fragments with a similar design traded from Gujarat to Egypt around the 15th to 16th century on the right. The use of deep indigo blue dye and printed white resist are both typical of these Indian cottons. Another piece, in my view, likely to be of Indian origin, and I know we've discussed this one a few times, is the one on the left discussed earlier by Sylvie, for which a date of the 17th or 18th century had been suggested on the basis of its rather elaborate floral design. However, as we've heard, the binding is dated 1597 and shows no sign of rebinding, which strongly indicates that the textile must also be no later than the late 16th century. A comparable piece in the Ashmolean Museum on the right from the Newbury collection of early Indian fabrics found in Egypt is of a similar type, even sharing the small white resist circles scattered amongst the tendrils. So the Armenian dated binding can usefully act as a benchmark from which to reconsider the dating of textiles with this type of design. It would be extremely useful to gather a corpus of dated bindings as a means of dating the associated textiles, paying close attention to whether or not the textiles could have been replaced at some stage. A type of Indian cloth that appears only rarely in Armenian bindings is known as chintz when exported to Europe and kalamkari in India and Iran, like these examples. As we heard from Thelma Thomas, they were made for Armenian churches, both in Armenian trading settlements in India and for export to Armenian centers like New Julfa and Jerusalem. The piece in the binding on the left was cut from a larger object, probably a hanging or vestment like the one on the right. These winged cherubs are a favorite Armenian motif and are often carved onto gravestones in Armenian cemeteries in India, as well as appearing on chintz textiles made for that market. This chintz fragment is undoubtedly Indian, 
The hand drawing, as opposed to printing technique, was perfected there, and its use is often a reliable way of distinguishing Indian textiles from their imitations made in Iran or Turkey. It's noticeable that the placing of this winged cherub, cherub within the binding has been done with care, something that's noticeably absent in many of the bindings, where the textiles are often rather haphazardly placed, sometimes with the design upside down or with two or three fragments of different textiles stuck together. Obviously, figurative designs like this one lend themselves to a particular placing on the board, unlike the repeating patterns that are seen in most of the Armenian binding textiles. One of the few other examples where unusual care was given uses another figurative Indian chintz fabric in which these two matched parrots are beautifully placed at the front and back of the binding. Perhaps not surprisingly, it seems that these figurative designs were respected in terms of their treatment in the binding more than a repeat design. These particular parrots may have come from a more secular textile like this hanging in the middle for a bed or wall, which would originally have been made for export. Tree patterns like this often have birds flying about their branches, as you can see in the detail um, on the right. Less elaborately drawn and dyed, but still apparently hand drawn with white resist, are these Indian textiles on two Armenian bindings with white curly motifs above rows of dots. And if I can use my cursor, I'm talking about this design here on the left one. They can be attributed to India because the uneven outlines and spacing of the designs identify the technique as hand drawing rather than block printing. As I mentioned earlier, this kind of hand drawing of a white resist against a colored ground wasn't widely done in either Turkey or Iran. Many of the Armenian bindings use textiles with somewhat crude single color red block prints like these. And these were probably made locally in Diyarbakir, today in Southeast Turkey, using locally grown cotton and madder dye. We know that Diyarbakir had been a center of cotton production since the 15th century, known for its madder dyed red or red and white textiles. By the early 19th century, there were some 500 printers working there. Much of what they produced from the 17th century onwards was in imitation of Indian imported printed cottons, which were superior in quality and according to 17th century records, cost three times as much as the local versions. The textile on the far right here is clearly very much in the Indian style. The textile on the far left is printed in imitation of an Indian tie dyed design, like the Indian turban cloth in the center. There are many imitations of Indian tie dyed textiles in the Armenian set, and these are almost certainly printed in Diabeka. But another possibility raises its head. Such block prints were also done in Madras, now Chennai in Southeast India, like the piece on the far right. While the Indian prints would still be superior to the Diabeka ones, it's possible that the Diabeka prints were made not in direct imitation of Indian tie-dyed textiles, but were actually copying South Indian prints. We've been attributing most of the Indian prints used in the Ethiopian and Armenian bindings to Gujarat in Northwest India, and that's certainly likely to be the case. But Madras, with its own block printing industry, and more importantly, its prominent Armenian merchant community, can't be ruled out as a place of origin for at least some of these prints. On the left is another printed imitation of an Indian tie-dyed fabric, in this case with the familiar spotted design. As you can see from the piece on the right, printed imitations were also made in India itself, like this piece from Surat in Gujarat. While the printed textile on the left is likely to be from Diyarbakir in Turkey, its debt to an Indian source is clear. An Indian tie-dyed silk textile was shown by Aob in his video, being held as an indicator of status by an Ethiopian ruler in the early 20th century, another example of a common use of Indian textiles in Ethiopia and Armenia. So why are Indian textiles so ubiquitous and so influential? We've seen this map before. I don't need to tell this group about trade routes, but this basic map is useful as a reminder of the centrality of India in both maritime and uh, overland global trade routes. This centrality isn't only geographical, but also cultural. India dominated the world's textile trade for several millennia. The sea trade from Gujarat, which in case you're not familiar with Gujarat is here by the eye of India, uh, to ports such as Mocha and Aden on the tip of the Arabian Peninsula here and the Ethiopian port of um, Masawa just across here, 
brought textiles which were then carried further overland. Some of the earliest Indian cotton textiles come, came from Gujarat and have been excavated from ports such as Berenike, further up the uh, Red Sea. And you can see here where the sea route ends at Berenike and the land route takes up. India had mastered the arts of cultivating cotton and spinning, weaving and dyeing it before other areas. And Indian cotton was in ever increasing demand throughout the world. A situation that continued until the development of industrial textile machines in the West and the subsequent export of Western textiles all over the world from the 19th century onwards, like this British printed cotton from Lancashire. Many of the British and European printed cottons that are found in the Ethiopian, Armenian and Yemeni bindings are likely to have come via India, probably from Bombay on the West Coast, but also perhaps from Madras and Calcutta on the East, rather than directly from Britain and Europe. As well as the Indian sea trade, equally important is the well-organized Armenian trade, uh, trading network, which saw Armenian traders based all over Europe and Asia, including China and Tibet. So entrenched were Armenians in Ethiopia, for example, that an Armenian, Hoja Murad, was chosen as the Ethiopian ambassador to the court of the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb in 1664. Perhaps it's possible that the, the luxurious Mughal fragments in the Ethiopian binding we saw earlier could be a remnant of a set of lavish garments, which we know was given by Aurangzeb as a gift to his Ethiopian counterpart. The date certainly fits the style of the textile. The presence of a considerable number of Italian silks also suggests that Venetian or Florentine traders could also have contributed to the Ethiopian trade. The Venetian's huge international network covering the Middle East, Iran and China was well established as early as the 13th century and included settlement in Alexandria by the 15th and could well have sent Italian silks to Ethiopia. The Portuguese are also known to have sent lavish textiles as gifts to Ethiopia in the 15th and 16th centuries and these were used in churches as well as in royal settings. It's possible that some of the finer Italian silk fragments that ended up in book bindings like this one could have been remnants from such diplomatic gifts. I'm just going to end with a few additional remarks on cloth book and manuscript wrappers and covers in South Asia, which I think are worth including in the discussion. On the left are two Sri Lankan textile wrappers for Buddhist palm leaf manuscripts. The one on the left shown wrapped around a manuscript and the one in the center opened out to show its cruciform shape. These are both made of an Indian fabric traded to Sri Lanka, as is the bag on the right, also made to protect a Buddhist manuscript. In the Punjab, textile covers are traditionally used for the Holy Book of the Sikhs, the Guru Granth Sahib as seen in the bottom image here. The tradition seems to have been carried over into both Christian and Muslim practice in the area. At the top left, we see an embroidered cover, probably for a Bible, that has the Ten Commandments embroidered in the typical Pulkari stitches of the Punjab and in the Gurmukhi script, kindly read by Jasdeep. And at top right, a rumal or cover for the Quran with the Nadi Ali, a Shia in, a Muslim invocation to Imam Ali, embroidered in the style of the Hindu so-called Chamba rumals from the same area. Textile covers for Jain manuscripts from Gujarat in Western India offer a huge range of materials to study. While many of these are embroidered like the two on the top row here, others use block printed cotton or other fabrics. Sometimes these covers can be significant survivals of early textiles like the Ikat velvet from the Wellcome Institute at the bottom left or the early Indian block print beside it. So these are just a few thoughts from my participation in this great project. There are many more areas to explore that I didn't have time to go into today. The project has provided an enormous amount of food for thought, especially about the international textile trade and how manuscripts can help to shed light on textile history and their usage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. That was excellent. Yes, Bring together many of the threads that we yes have been have been presented over the last two days and discussed over the last many months as well. Uh, we're going to turn to Suzanne now, and um, she's going to respond to. Um, yeah, things we've discussed themes throughout the, the two day event, and then we'll open it up for the last 15 or 20 minutes or so to all the panelists as a discussion and anyone else that wants to keep adding things to the chat, please do and we'll try and capture those and pass them along. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Rosemary, and um, for uh, not just for your contributions in this last presentation, but throughout the entire workshop. 
And thanks to all of you for uh, the series of panel presentations and discussion that we've enjoyed over the last little while. I've learned a lot and hope you have too. And I'm really looking forward to seeing where this conversation will go again, not just today, but going forward. In the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'd like to draw together some strands of our conversations over the last few days. Um, I've purposely written this on the fly and partly in the form of rough notes because I wanted to respond to what's been said and to provide some useful stimulus to the general discussion that will follow. I'll begin by commenting on how I come to this material, especially in dialogue with the approach that Alex Gillespie outlined in her opening presentation, and I'll tell how we came to put together a workshop on textiles. We'll also talk about some of the methodological issues that we've developed over the life of this project before turning to make a few comments on the six panel sessions we've heard, drawing out some topics that we might continue to discuss today and beyond. Throughout these two days, we've been reminded of what we might call the life of the book. First, in Hawk Kacher Kacherian's moving words, what, when he said that the manuscript needs to be open to breathe, he said, the manuscript is alive. Ayub Durillo picked up on this thought when he said of Ethiopian manuscripts that the volume takes up the scent of where it's been, and he emphasized what he called the physicality of the manuscript. As a living object, these devotional manuscripts receive careful attention and, in Ayub's words, the dedication of those who are entrusted with it and who may, he said, beautify the manuscript with textiles. The exotic cloth paste downs are an expression of that devotion. We can also think of the life of the book in terms of its life cycle. In Alex Gillespie's words, the book is a vibrant archive, itself a record of the materials and the craft practices that make it up. This vibrant archive is generated not only in the original instantiation of the manuscript, but also in the repeated moments of making and remaking, rebinding, rededication, and so on. The book has its own life, and the presentations we've heard have gone a long way toward telling, it, it, telling us its many multiple stories. Uh, Martin also put this well, saying each volume has its own story, and um, I really want to sit with that. Alex began our sessions yesterday by explaining how she approaches this material. As a codicologist originally trained in the study of insular manuscripts, but one who came to be increasingly interested in and knowledgeable about the technologies of manuscript production and the analytical scientific methods that might be brought to the study of the book. My own approach is very different. I am not a codicologist, though I've picked up a little bit over the last few years working with this outstanding team of researchers. And so it's not a fascination with the book that brings me to this work. Instead, it's a deep interest in how we might understand the nature of the pre-modern interconnected world and the methodological implications that flow from that understanding. Whether we're talking about region-based approaches to the medieval world, whether in terms of Mediterranean studies, Silk Road studies, or even the global turn, there's always a risk that such a capacious approach will introduce its own distortions and even impose a kind of colonial Eurocentric perspective on the materials we study. We were reminded of these risks yesterday in discussing Yorios Budalis' recommendations regarding the terminology that we should apply to the study of the book, avoiding terms that are specific to or emerge from one particular tradition, for example, the doublure, um, so that we don't simply assimilate the heterogeneity of book formats around the world to that preconceived notion. And this is something that Martin also brought out and, and Michelle as well, beautifully um, in their talk for us today. In other words, my perspective is one that doesn't assume that the book is the obvious object of study. Instead, it uses the book as a window into the past, understanding the materials and above all the craft practices that generate, maintain, and recreate the book as absolutely central. Books give us a way to know more about the communities and the individual people who produced them, about those who read, touched, and used them individually or collectively, about their movement from one place to another, whether through displacement of people, as in the Armenian case, um, or in the violent appropriation of the colonial archive, as in the case of Ethiopia. The history of one individual book is a way to tell one strand in a rich and complex account of the past. This work, however, as we all know, requires collaboration, which is something that has preoccupied us over the last few years in the Book in the Silk Roads project. Not whether to collaborate, which we knew we had to do, but how. From the earliest project phase, we drew together groups of people who could help us to think through some of the guiding questions. What kind of terminology to use? How to think about periodization? whether to focus on regional entanglements or on global perspectives. And we've continued in an iterative way to develop networks of collaboration that would help us, in Alex Gillespie's words, to build a network that takes us out of those silos. In particular, we've come to focus on single objects, a, a block printed leaf from the Dunhuang Caves held at the Royal Ontario Museum, the Kashmiri manuscript at the Fisher Library, which we heard about earlier today, and many others, in a series of case studies that draw together a team of specialists each of whom brings a very different kind of expertise to the object. 
Each team is def different depending upon the object. One technician might carry out the micro CT scanning of the manuscript binding. A specialist in literary or intellectual history might provide expertise on the text contained in that book. Another might be a conservator with particular knowledge of the paper or the parchment types and so on. I won't go into more detail about this approach now, but I mention it both because it provides insight into the project as a whole and because it informs the way we've developed this workshop, drawing together a cluster of researchers around a particular object, a particular tradition, and asking them to place it in its larger regional context, here with a particular focus on textiles. And importantly, this has been an iterative approach, both with regard to the research teams where we've added expertise to each panel as we proceeded, and with regard to the audience experience. As you know, the pre-recorded videos have provided a basis for workshop attendees to enter the material, and the live discussions have provided a basis for greater depth and sharing of conclusions across uh, regional fields. In the case of the session on Islamic manuscripts, we've even had richer engagement made possible by one set of researchers, Karen Shepper and Sabina Schmidtke, making the video and with a particular focus on Yemeni manuscripts, and a second set of researchers offering their perspectives on the field today. I can't take credit for putting together the events of this beautiful workshop, but I can take credit for continuously nagging our book and the Silk Roads group about textiles and manuscripts, asking what were they for, what did they mean, and that's ultimately what brought us here today. More seriously, what began my interest in textiles and manuscripts was the study in 2019 of the textiles in one particular Ethiopian manuscript which I presented in February at the Getty in a visit just before the lockdown. And it was titled, the talk I gave was titled Cover Up and Unveiling, Ethiopian Manuscripts and Representing Africa and Medieval Studies. It was a chance for me to talk about our research project in general and to make some comparisons between the Ethiopian gospel book that I was studying and related objects in the Getty's own collection. At Brian Keane's encouragement, however, I had widened the focus of that study day beyond the Ethiopian manuscripts to consider textiles and manuscripts among the Gettys holdings more generally, and also to share some preliminary work at that time that we'd done on the Kashmiri manuscript of the Fisher, um, which we discussed earlier. This in turn stimulated conversations, including my first meeting with Nancy Turner, which was wonderful, both at the Getty and again back home, resulting in our book in the Silk Roads team deciding to do a workshop on textiles and manuscripts. This event, we realized, would provide both specialist knowledge of each particular tradition focused on one exemplar, whether Syriac, Armenian, and so on, but it would also provide an opportunity to talk across fields, discovering common ground and unexpected linkages that might help us to better understand the nature of the interconnected pre-modern world. Um, I'd like to briefly share my PowerPoint now, um, so I want to show you a few images. You can see that okay? Um, yep, looks great. Thank you. Um, I wanna give a quick example of how our discussions of textiles and manuscripts over the past days might help us to think in both a subject and region specific way, in this case about Ethiopian manuscripts, but also across various fields and regions. So I had gotten interested looking at some um, Ethiopian manuscripts that were um, on loan at the Art Gallery of Ontario in the textiles there. They were paste down um, board linings, but and there's also a um, gospel book from the early 16th century, around 1500, that had some interesting textiles in it, um, veils covering pages that included the four um, gospel uh, evangelists. And, you know, the coarse cloth, this one was missing its sheet, but you could see the pinholes, um, the, the needle marks where it had been attached. Um, and the particularly interesting one was John, because it had a textile covering it that had an additional part of the textile, um, a part of textile attached to it, a more decorative one, which you can see here more closely. So I was very curious why this carefully preserved additional textile? Um, what could we possibly um, infer about it? Um, Ayub in conversation suggested that a repurposing of uh, a luxurious textile, maybe even something that had been imbued with some kind of um, sacred quality, something like what um, Paul was discussing with us earlier when he was talking about that blue, the blue and white spine lining from Yemen and talking about blue and white and other kinds of textile fragments like these two we see here. Um, you know, could there be a similar kind of function in that textile fragment? Um, and how could that Ethiopian example that I just showed you briefly, um, how could we relate it to and also differentiate it from the use of textile veils and other traditions? including the luxurious fabrics of Byzantine and Armenian examples. 
Um, so this is sort of opening up a whole range of possible questions. Um, and so that's that, that was just sort of my way of getting at it, which I wanted to share with you. So before turning to some comments um, on and images from the individual panels that we've had yesterday and today, I'd like to make one additional point about the methodology of the Book in the Silk Roads project and the way that this methodology has developed over time. You'll have noticed that a few of us included land acknowledgements, myself, Alex Gillespie, Brian Keane, and it could be that even if some of you agreed that this was an ethical and appropriate thing to do, I suspect that many of you assume that this acknowledgement is not integrally related related to the work that we're doing together here. On a deeper level though, pertaining to the backbone of the ongoing work of the project, this grounding of our work, beginning with the land we're on, this specific land that we're on, is fundamental. If we wish to approach the global pre-modern, we need to begin with the land that we are on, placing the local intention with, in conversation with, in relation with the global. There's a great deal to say about how this might work in methodological terms, and I'm happy to talk about this either today or in some other setting. But for our purposes today, let me illustrate how this approach informs our work with one particular example, as you can see, birch bark here in situ. We have been thinking for some time about writing substrates. As Alex mentioned in her opening remarks yesterday, the word beach is cognate with the word book, book in early English, and many languages preserve this relationship between their word for the book and the substrate upon which it is written. It's natural then that our thoughts would turn to parchment, paper, and inevitably birch bark. If you had asked me at the beginning of our work on the book in the Silk Roads project what a workshop on birch, birch bark substrates might look like, I would have said the following. We'll divide up the workshop across two days, half a day each on the use of birch bark as a substrate in three regions, Scandinavia, Northern Russia, Northwest India, especially Kashmir, and the indigenous populations of the Great Lakes and Eastern Woodland regions of North America. Now, however, our approach looks very different. If we begin with the local, with the land that we're on, we need to slow down and think carefully about our approach. How can we do so in a respectful way and with the full acknowledgement of the relationships, both human and non-human, that are involved? I won't take more time today to talk about this thinking and planning, but I mention it to give a sense of our methodology, the extent to which we aim to situate the global in relationship to the local, and our iterative, iterative approach in developing our research methodologies and our collaborations, which we understand as ongoing relationships. So let me turn now from my prepared remarks to some comments that pick up on the sequence of panels we've heard, which I hope will open out into a general discussion amongst the panelists with questions and comments from the audience. So I give a sense of things that struck me, not only from the wonderful videos um, that we um, had posted and been able to enjoy for a period of time before today's and yesterday's workshop, but also some um, moments that I snatched and I'm sharing here. The first panel, um, we heard about Syriac manuscripts with Georgios Goudalis, Aaron Butts, and Thelma Thomas. And Thelma opened up beautifully, literally, with this um, opening of a book, which she said captivated her. What she didn't say is that she initially, when I wrote to her to ask her if she'd participate, uh, Melissa and I had written and she's like, oh, I'm too busy. And then I sent her the picture and I said, oh, it's really neat. I really, and she's, and she folded at that point. Um, so the opening of that book, which opened our panels, I think um, is a particularly apt image for us to think about together. Erin put that in the context of the Syriac Christian communities and Georgia has put this um, object um, into an incredibly rich context, thinking about the common ground of Byzantine, Islamic, early Arabic, Armenian, Georgian, and Coptic manuscript binding structures and features. He put, uh, showed us how these um, features are more close to one another than different, in his words, um, and showing us the vertebrae of the book. He was able to explain the ways in which craft practices and book binding are, are, are one thing, and we need to really understand these in a unified kind of way. And then later on, Jeff Steep today sort of brought out the way in which leatherworking as well provides us a really profound way of understanding what's happening with the craft practices of the book, the making. Um, and I feel like that's an extremely generative conversation. Georgios also urged us to um, use technical terminology, not ethno-national or religious categories to describe the elements of the book. And this focus on terminology is something that I hope will carry forward. Perhaps we'll discuss it today, but uh, for our project, I know this is something we are thinking about and working on very actively. Thelma also brought out the ways in which the Indian style block printing in these Syriac manuscripts 
um, could tell us something about trade and exchange, but it could also help us to think about the what she called the emergent corpus of Syriac manuscripts with textiles and understanding the distinction between what is done in the style of a place as opposed to what is sourced from elsewhere. And Rosemary also was unfolding that in some more detail. And again, this seems to me a really important a line of inquiry, both, both in terms of the trees and the forest, that is the specific information we might gain there, but also the big pictures about global connectivity. Um, here, looking at this um, uh, uh, preservation of uh, part of a vestment inside of a uh, book spine lining and its possible apotropy function, Nancy Turner asked, I thought beautifully, does the book become a kind of Geniza where precious objects that cannot be discarded are stored? Um, and this was um, fruitful and reemerged at certain moments um, uh, in conversations later on. There was a comment in the chat about presenting and reusing vestments of highly venerated leaders, integrating them into new textiles or other liturgical objects. And Thelma Thomas then characterized work aesthetic, and I really like that phrase. In the turn to Armenian manuscripts, um, again, it was incredibly rich discussion. Um, we learned about the luxurious dressing and redressing, um, the Byzantine tradition of dressing books and cloth, and um, the richness of that uh, was, I found, kind of overwhelming. Brian placed this use of textiles into a wider context for us, reminding us of how this plays out in other traditions and giving us a wide framework in which to think about this. And Sylvie uh, brought out uh, the, uh, uh, the power of the book and the communities that gather around the book, the heterogeneous community, showing us this uh, miraculous book here at left that's um, adorned with votive or offerings reflecting a, a wide range of um, donors. And that was extraordinarily interesting food for thought. And commenting at the end, Barry Floods uh, gave us some additional examples from Georgia. And he said something really interesting and useful there, I think. He said how these show patterns of trade and movement of textiles from different places. Um, he said Indian examples predominate, showing what he called a kind of global cosmopolitanism. He said, but how we nuance that remains open for discussion and debate. He said, I don't know yet how to think about this. And I, I really appreciated that uncertainty because I agree that global cosmopolitanism might be a good way to think about it, but there is a, uh, there's a lot of implications there. And the session on Ethiopian manuscripts gave us an amazing array of textile samples and uh, possibilities with regard to database development. And this is something that I know that we're going to want to continue be talking about, to be talking about um, both as Rosemary was mentioning just now as a way of um, providing um, firmly dated manuscripts that have textiles in them that we might be able to extrapolate from and, um, uh, and also in what it tells us about the specific regions that we're studying. The global was much in evidence here, as was the case in the discussion of Armenian manuscripts, the global movement of materials, people, ideas, crafts, and practices. Michael Gerber has talked about the specific trade connections and trying to wonder how this could account for the proportions of silk containing textiles, which he said were approximately 70% of their database, which is extraordinary, and their remote origins. And he asked, what were the specific trade connections that made possible the availability of Chinese and other Far Eastern textiles in the highlands of Ethiopia? So in other words, not just what trade works, uh, what networks of trade and exchange brought these materials across the Indian Ocean, but from the East African coast up into the highlands, because that's also um, requires some, um, some serious thought. Today, turning to Chinese manuscripts, we saw um, uh, marvelous wrappers from Dunhuang that Michelle showed to us, as well as these sutra uh, wrapper formats that were quite different and absolutely fascinating. Martin encouraged us to think carefully about the vocabulary we use. Michelle had already said we needed to think about whether recto and verso were really the terms we wanted to use for those sutra wrappers. And Martin explained how the codex has a very different meaning in Chinese book forms. Uh, manuscript two doesn't really make sense in that context because while we could talk about a movement from manuscript to print in the European setting, these two formats absolutely coexist in China. And so it's a very different environment. He also brought out dating questions because um, in uh, uh, the printing situation, the colophons can provide unreliable evidence. Um, they um, can give a sense of when the block was made, but not a sense of when the printing um, was done or, or anything else. They can, however, provide evidence about the life of the book, that is the way in which it moved from hand to hand. And that is a rich and valuable thing. Finally, Martin emphasized the distinction between museums and libraries, which can hold very similar objects and uh, a museum might understand it as being a textile with some text, whereas the library will understand it as a text, maybe it has a textile. So increasing communication and making sure that there's good metadata and that um, labeling and digitization is being carried out in a useful kind of way to mobilize everything that the object can tell us. Textiles and Islamic manuscripts, I had to really restrain myself from just screenshotting every single image we saw because it was so incredible. 
Um, I really want to thank Paul and Allison for this beautiful presentation. They showed us uh, textile and doubloor printing and these wonderful textile covers from that were commissioned by Mehmet II, which Paul showed us a rare usage of textile covers in the late 15th century, which seems to have gone nowhere, except that he then showed us also these later textile covers, which he said are very understudied, um, suggesting that uh, research might be done to establish whether there is some kind of connection. He also showed us this wonderful um, Yemeni spine binding um, uh, that um, uh, is part of the Hill Manuscript um, Museum and Manuscript Library collection and suggested, as I mentioned earlier, the connections this might have to other kinds of practices where textiles associated with a holy person um, are mobilized within the book. Um, Eva Fromovich had also asked a wonderful, uh, made a wonderful comment in the chat, asking if there is a kind of a direction of movement of such sacred uh, textiles. She had said in, um, uh, in the Jewish tradition, um, things can move up a ladder of sanctity. So for example, a bride's garment could become a, a covering for um, a holy object or even a, a Torah. Um, and so is there a similar kind of vector of sacrality associated with textile uh, reusage, repurposing in other traditions? Something to think about. And uh, finally, with the textiles in Kashmiri manuscript session, um, the, we saw the incredible heterogeneity you might find in a relatively confined, limited area. And we saw the extraordinary, um, uh, unique end band reconstruction that Jastip was able to um, unfold for us. And that work, which he described as being still in progress, seems to be extraordinarily fruitful and fascinating. Talked about the Fisher manuscript in particular, and Marika um, brought out um, the specifically Kashmiri formats that we see in the illustrated pages of Qurans and related manuscripts in that region. So a very heterogeneous tradition. As I said before, we could do a whole workshop just on Kashmir. So in ending, I just want to um, open things out to discussion and maybe encourage us to think about next steps. What do we need to do? Clearly, we need dated manuscripts with textiles in a database. This would be transformational, both for the specific areas that we're studying and for the study of textiles, as Rosemary was laying out a little bit earlier. We need, as a number of people have said, to make sure that curators are noting the presence of textiles in the objects that they um, protect and look after. And similarly, that metadata is doing a good job of communicating information about what textiles are contained in manuscripts. So I'd encourage us to think about other things we might do. So after some discussion um, at the end, I wanna turn things over to Melissa. And at the end, we'll make sure people know how to navigate to our bi bibliography on the website, and also tell you a little bit about the resources that we want to make available. And um, talk about next steps, what you would like to do, what you would like to learn about, what you would like to discuss together. We are here to facilitate and to serve. Thanks.